Now, starting off with uh, a rather unusual one in the top left hand corner uh, where uh, Thames water utilities were found to be liable for uh, smell uh, 1.5 to 5 percent. Uh, and then across on the right hand side, uh, the case of uh, Bryden versus uh, Islington. And that's a case with uh, a problem in the kitchen, a leak to the corner of the kitchen. Uh, that led to uh, a 10 to uh, a 20 percent reduction in rent just for a leak in the corner of the kitchen. On the bottom left hand side, we have Morjani, I believe, versus uh, Durban Estates. Dilapidated common parts were in play here, and uh, that led to uh, 5%, so quite significant for common parts. And uh, also for uh, decorative damage at 15% uh, of rent uh, following a leak. And uh, that's always something which is very, very difficult to uh, legislate against. But again, I suspect in this case that uh, a landlord was on notice of that particular problem. Uh, also important probably at this point to say to you that uh, if you've got uh, a latent defect and so uh, I mean a good example might be if uh, a tenant is injured by the collapse of a ceiling but no one could have predicted that that uh, ceiling was going to uh, collapse then the landlord is not liable. Uh, on the uh, bottom right hand side we have arms versus uh, wheel property company limited and that uh, led to 30% for uh, penetrating dampness and also for uh, defective plaster. Now, important to stop and think about the plaster for a second, because uh, for many, many years when I was doing this job, uh, the courts weren't awarding damages for problems with the plaster. It was just regarded as uh, a decorative finish. But that's no longer the case. The uh, the plaster is part of what makes the structure of a property and so defective plaster can lead to awards of damages. Uh, if I can have the uh, the next slide please. Uh, the next one here, Bitten uh, versus uh, Home from 2014. Now again a leak in the bathroom and uh, presumably quite a serious leak. Also, loss of heating. Now, hopefully the loss of heating wasn't for very long because uh, courts are very strict on that when it comes to uh, the winter months and also for uh, perished ceilings. And so we're getting higher up as we go through these cases. And uh, the next one we have is Aslam versus Ali from uh, 2009. And here we have what uh, was described as substantial disrepair and uh, for a bit more detail, penetrating damp, loss of heating, defective plaster and drafty windows. So that's, that's, quite, that's quite a lot to be dealing with and uh, quite clearly the landlord was heavily punished for that. But it goes higher than that in the next case, which I think is Ungoma versus Dillon, and that was 70%. Uh, and that's penetrating damp and leaks, structural cracking, and also strong odours from the landlord's incomplete drainage works. Uh, so odours, as we've seen from the earlier case, and also here, can uh, be a problem if you haven't kept the installation serving the property in a proper working order. Uh, if I could have the uh, the next slide, please. Another one here for loss of hot water and heating, uh, Fakari versus Newman. And it starts with, uh, again, a heavy punishment, 75% uh, for complete loss of hot water and heating, uh, but uh, goes down, as you can see, to 43% uh, when there was no heating, but still hot water. Uh, the next one, uh, a rat infestation in the case of Reed versus uh, Notting Hill Housing Trust. Now, plainly there has to be a link between the rat infestation and the contract. Uh, it must be shown that uh, there is some sort of disrepair or some sort of uh, unfitness or a good strong unfitness argument. 
to show you that uh, you're responsible for the rat infestation. Uh, I believe also that, uh, I don't have the case for this, I'm afraid, but I believe you get less for mice. But uh, if someone can find that case, I'd be delighted. Uh, right down to the extreme, which is the 100%, and uh, that's Whittingdon versus Udin. And that was simply decided an uninhabitable property, no rental value at all if it's uninhabitable, and a hundred percent was awarded in that case. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. And so we're thinking here beyond the usual damages for breach of uh, the disrepair requirements and looking at the uh, fitness for human habitation uh, point. And yes, damages can be awarded for that. Uh, so as with uh, the repairing covenants, it's now implied into the contract. And uh, the same uh, consequences may follow, but always remembering that we have defenses to this. Uh, and uh, much like this repair, you will find that diminution of rent is likely to be used to calculate damages. And uh, it seems to me, certainly for judges, it's, it's quite emotive if a property is unfit for uh, human habitation. And so it does beg the question, uh, what percentage diminution would be appropriate if that property is so far defective as to be unfit for human habitation? Again, as Clive and Elliot mentioned also earlier on in the training, it's those words, so far defective. And so it's very, very important we bear down on that. We make sure that we're arguing that a property is not so far effective as to be unfit for human habitation. Because if we fail in that argument, then I predict there are plenty of judges out there just waiting to punish us for it with, with heavy awards of damages. If I can have the, uh, the next slide, please. Now, the first case here, Warren versus Keane, which uh, I think has cropped up a couple of times uh, already uh, during the masterclass. And uh, it's a very, very old case and it involves uh, Lord Denning, who some of you may have heard of, and uh, all about what the tenant must do to uh, look after the property, I suppose, in what we call a tenant-like fashion. And uh, I do actually have uh, a quote from the case. It's very brief, I'll reassure you. Uh, and uh, Lord Denning said that uh, it was an obligation on the tenant to do the little jobs around the place which a reasonable tenant would do. And uh, so that begs the question, well, what does that include? And uh, here, I think uh, Denning mentioned uh, turning the water off when the tenant went away, uh, cleaning chimneys, cleaning windows, mending fuses, unblocking sinks. So pretty basic stuff. And uh, I know that uh, there was a case uh, some years ago after that uh, decision in Warren versus Keene where a landlord said that uh, changing a tap washer should be added to Lord Denning's list, but that actually failed. Uh, and so uh, uh, that was, I think, around about 15 years ago. And uh, also, I think at around about the same time, uh, we were looking at this, this problem about cleaning chimneys. And there was a case which uh, I discovered uh, a few days ago, which said that uh, if you've got a chimney, which is uh, in a property uh, in a small cottage on the moors where there was wood or coal burned and the chimney used in an old fashioned way, well, perhaps, but in modern housing, a tenant's not obliged fix gas fire or remove a back plate or clean the flue behind it and so I think we're not going to see an, an expanding list of the little jobs about the place that the reasonable tenant has to do. Uh, now the next case Bowl versus uh, Huntsbuild uh, 2009 uh, important to remember that uh, you must consider whether the property as a whole is unfit for uh, habitation not necessary to consider each defect individually. It's a composite approach that we're taking here. Uh, another 
I think, interesting case uh, below that is Liverpool City Council versus Cassim from uh, 2012. And uh, that involves the possibility that a heating system might be prohibitively expensive to use. And uh, that was considered to be uh, a relevant consideration as to whether a hazard existed under the Housing Act of 2004. And so that's going to feed into fitness for uh, habitation. And uh, you may find that uh, in some older properties, even in some newer ones, there is a heating system that is simply inefficient and costs an absolute fortune to run. And uh, clearly on that, uh, in that particular case, the tenant uh, attracted the sympathy of the court simply because it was impossible to keep the property warm. If I can have the, uh, the next slide, please. Now, these are cases which are ongoing for us. And uh, the first one here is uh, Fitzroy Place Residential Limited. And uh, a very unusual case involving, I dare say, a very, very expensive property. But we can extrapolate the, uh, some learning from that. This is a property which is worth £2,595,000. And uh, the... Uh, Lessee, the owner of the property, is claiming that the apartment is blighted by an unexplained noise loud enough to wake him and is therefore unfit for human habitation. Now, we'll have to get to the bottom of what the unexplained noise is and how loud it truly is, whether the landlord is responsible for that. But I think that uh, if it turns out to be uh, a landlord fault, it'll be very, very interesting to see how that case is decided. Uh, another one uh, which is ongoing at the moment is RG Securities Limited versus Allianz and others. Uh, and in this case, uh, the uh, claimant purchased a block of flats from the defendants. Uh, and uh, in part of the claim, there's reference to the defendants uh, refurbishing in 2006 to 2009 with cladding, which is described as more flammable even than that used on uh, Grenfell, that no reasonably competent developer would have used. Uh, and uh, in that case, the claimant is going to argue that the block is unfit for human habitation as a result. And uh, quite eye-watering costs, I'm not quite sure where they got the 70 pence from, but uh, three and a half million there to, uh, to rectify. So we'll, we'll certainly be watching out for that one in the next few months. Uh, if I could have the uh, the next slide, please. Now, again, uh, and this is my uh, my final slide. Uh, as has been mentioned before, uh, liability and damages don't accrue until uh, notice of, of uh, the disrepair has been given, and a reasonable time has elapsed in which the repair could have been carried out. As I think has been said earlier, there isn't actually a set reasonable time in law. And uh, you're always going to be looking at uh, what needs to be repaired. And so if you've got a uh, simple repair, uh, it should be done relatively quickly within uh, a few days of being notified. If you've got a repair which causes a serious uh, impact on the tenant's enjoyment, that can be done quickly. This will only highlight that fact. Uh, if, on the other hand, you've got, uh, say, subsidence, you may need to uh, stop and get a specialist out, a structural engineer out. There will need to be a serious amount of investigations and reporting. There'll need to be a decant and there'll need to be comprehensive works to uh, deal with that subsidence. Well, plainly, that can't be dealt with in a couple of weeks that will take a long long time and uh you will find that uh courts will uh, grant a bit more slack to landlords on or in circumstances like that so long as you can show that you're getting on with it as fast as you reasonably can and uh finally from me there is a is a quote which says that a reasonable time is and i quote time to find out what is wrong take necessary advice prepare a specification and to select and instruct a builder. And so that's something which, again, just like the award of damages, it depends on the facts and circumstances of the case. Now, 
that's all I wanted to say in my part of the presentation. There may be some questions come through at the end, but uh, I'll hand back to Jonathan for his part of this presentation now. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, and certainly, Ian will be available along with Clive, Ellie and Will for our Q&A session uh, before we finish up um, a little bit later this afternoon. So my task is to focus uh, further on damages. And uh, Sophie, if I may ask for the further slides, thank you. And to look at some additional case law that uh, speaks to uh, the points, uh, that is the slide there. The, the slides, uh, that slide, uh, as you can see, uh, sets out an additional four cases that are relevant to the question of damages. And as Clive uh, and indeed Ellie, uh, Will and of course uh, Ian have mentioned, the calculation of damages in the context of disrepair uh, is a long running and, and somewhat um, messy exercise because there was a period of time where the court decided the damages are awarded by taking a global overview of how the resident in question had been affected by the state of their property. And that was essentially wrapped up in a term that we have described in the past as general damages. And that is the annoyance, the discomfort, uh, the inconvenience of having to live in a property that is in a state of disrepair. As Ian mentioned more recently, the demolition of rent uh, formula is the method of choice uh, adopted by the courts in deciding uh, general damages. And that is essentially the more serious the disrepair, the higher percentage in rent paid by the resident is then paid back in general damages. Uh, and so those percentages that you saw in Ian's slide speak to that. The more serious the disrepair, the higher the percentage in damage, general damage is payable. But it's also relevant to bear in mind, and the courts do uh, take into account uh, the wider circumstances uh, of the uh, state of the property in respect of the inconvenience of living at that property for the resident in question. So in 1995, uh, we see that damages were awarded for unsuitable temporary accommodation. That was in a situation where their uh, main home was rendered so unsuitable that the landlord found temporary accommodation uh, for the family. In this case, as we see, the temporary accommodation was also found to be unsuitable. And so adopting the old style general damages calculation, the annoyance, inconvenience, and discomfort, the court increased the general damages payable to take into account the fact that the temporary accommodation was also rendered unsuitable. So it, it is it is a interesting case and a relevant case to bear in mind in circumstances where you are decanting the resident in question so that works can be carried out to their main home. Make sure that that temporary accommodation is fit for purpose because you could be hit with a double whammy, if you like, if the temporary accommodation is also uh, unsuitable. In the case of Lubrin and Lambeth Borough Council, a 1988 decision, there the courts said that a claimant can claim additional general damages for the inconvenience of having uh, to obtain temporary accommodation. So again, uh, not using the more recent demolition of rent damage, general damages calculation, but taking into account um, a, a figure by virtue of the general inconvenience or annoyance caused by the state of the property. There the court said that the sheer fact of having to turn your mind to finding somewhere else to live, engaging with their landlord to ensure that that happened would increase the level of general damages uh, that was payable. In 1984, the McGrill and Work uh, decision, a well-known decision, uh, the court there found that a landlord was financially liable for failing to clear up after works and not redecorating. Again, a failure on the part of the landlord to undertake those two tasks 
merely served to increase uh, the level of general damages payable, and that was because of the annoyance and the discomfort and, dare I say, the inconvenience of having to step over the uh, the rubble and the mess at the front entrance and also the unpleasantness of uh, having to live, um, indeed, sleep in rooms that were not the uh, uh, redecorated, essentially uh, covered in concrete. Uh, unpleasant, and the court took that into account. And then in 1999, the court decided that uh, once a glass window was broken, the landlord was liable for injury. And what that also speaks to is that in where damage has been caused that could expose your residents to injury, that in itself is a factor in deciding on the level of general damages that might be payable uh, by a landlord to a resident. Uh, that's largely historical because we were talking and we are talking to general damages calculation. But so if you, if you could go to the next slide, what I will do is, uh, thank you Sophie, is fast forward to 2018 where of course the demolition of rent uh, formula in the calculation of general damages uh, is very much the order of the day. Remember, the worse the state of the property, the higher uh, percentage in rent paid during the period of discomfort is returned in the form of general damages. Here, the tenant and landlord were unable to agree a schedule of works in a disrepair claim. It was held that once the landlord was aware that there was serious damp, uh, there was a duty to do at least what the expert, that is the uh, landlord expert, said needed to be done. And so this is a, an interesting and relevant case because what it does speak to is that where you as a landlord become aware of repair works that are required to essentially your assets, and do bear in mind it is your assets and you have those repairing obligations as set out in the tenancy agreement and of course in legislation. You are on notice as Ellie had mentioned earlier, and you are obliged then to take steps to carry out repair works. The mere fact that you can't agree on a schedule of works uh, with the resident or their resident's legal representative does not stop the clock in terms of calculation, the calculation of damages, and importantly, does not uh, essentially prevent you or, or, or stop you from carrying out the works that your expert has identified. And, and what is interesting about this case is, well, if that is the case, we and we know that we are obliged to carry out these works, we realize the damages clock is ticking, so to speak, but the residents and their legal representatives are simply not cooperating with us. Uh, where does that leave us? Well, in that situation, as Will had talked about earlier, you are going to have to consider access injunction proceedings. You are going to have to remind the resident and their uh, legal representative that you have a contractual and legal obligation to effect repairs regardless of being unable to agree a schedule of works. And if they don't cooperate and give access, well, then you have no choice but to consider redress uh, through the courts. Uh, in my experience, uh, the moment you threaten that sort of uh, robust action in the courts requiring access, the resident and their legal representative will back down and miraculously a schedule of works will then be agreed. But you have to be prepared to be robust in defending your position and in demanding access uh, given your repairing obligations. Uh, Sophie, uh, next slide. So as uh, Ian mentioned, the second element to the damages calculation is special damages. General damages, the demolition of rent uh, percentage calculation, but in addition, the special damages, which is uh, a resident asking for monies returned to them by virtue of having items of belongings damaged or destroyed by virtue of a leak into the property or, or some other 
uh, ingress, water ingress typically that has caused damage. Now, as uh, Ellie had mentioned, typically your uh, letter, the letter of claim in compliance with the protocol will make reference to the resident wanting to claim uh, special damages in addition to the general damages and providing you with a list of items that um, they want compensation for. But as Ian mentioned, the basic rule is that it's the value of the item at the time that item was damaged or destroyed and not the item as new. And that's a key consideration to take into account in deciding what sort of special damages you should be paying to uh, the resident in circumstances where you realize that you are contractually on the hook uh, given the state of the property. What we do is that we will support you in determining what the actual value um, at the time of loss could be. And actually what Ellie does is that she pops onto eBay and she will then find out the true value of a second-hand mattress or the true value of a second-hand leather jacket. And you'll be surprised what Ellie can find on uh, uh, eBay and on Gumtree, which is the other site that uh, she frequently visits. And um, did you know that a value of a second-hand mattress um, goes for less than three quid uh, at, uh, and so therefore uh, very different to the value of a mattress as new. And those are the sort of things that you need to be aware of and those sort of calculations you need to factor into how you respond to the claim. Uh, Sophie, uh, next slide then. And so that is it for me, a little cameo uh, performance near the end, and I will join you all uh, for the general Q&A session shortly. But what I'd now like to do is to hand over to Clive to end off where essentially we began at 10 o'clock this morning by exploring some of the Q&A text that I see has been very uh, busy, as well as looking at some of the uh, recent reasons for the rise in disrepair cases and how to respond to them. Thanks very much. Thank you again, Jonathan. Um, so uh, why has there been a rise in disrepair cases? Uh, and we'll see from uh, this leaflet, which was posted to one of our clients uh, in the south of the country from a, uh, a firm with an 0161 uh, STD code. So that's in Manchester. Uh, you see at the bottom of their leaflet, they say, we are local solicitors opposite KFC on Rowlands Way. Of course, local only if you happen to live in Manchester uh, by the opposite the KFC. Uh, this was posted, as I said, to uh, an organisation we act for down in the south of England. Uh, they're about 400 miles away from the property that was uh, inserted through the letterbox. So hardly what one would describe as a, a local firm. What we are seeing is due to the changes that the government have made in the personal injury sector. Uh, this is on the next slide, if I may. Um, the, uh, the government has, has bowed to the pressure that's come from the motor insurance sector. So what in effect has been happening is that the insurers have been lobbying like mad, have been coming together and have been saying to the government, of course, we're getting absolutely robbed blind by these uh, ambulance chasers. And every time somebody has a, a minor little dink in a Tesco's car park, we get a claim for two, three grand for alleged whiplash injuries. And then very typically a claim for sort of 10, 12 pounds, thousand pounds worth of legal costs for this minor RTA. Uh, and so the government have responded to that and have changed the rules on personal injury claims. In effect, what they have done is, is ripped out the profitability for the so-called ambulance chasers to rent now run those claims. There's very little money in it, or certainly not, not what it was uh, four or five years ago. So um, the firms that would typically uh, go around 
uh, advertising in hospital waiting rooms and doctors waiting rooms and on the internet and we probably remember from a few years ago those adverts for personal injury lawyers for you uh, all that you'll have noticed is now pretty much stopped because there's just simply as i said no money in the market anymore because of the government have changed the rules however what the government didn't do is at the point that they changed the rules on the personal injury claims they didn't enact those same changes for the disrepair sector so the ambulance chasers were either going to go bust or they were simply going to look for other areas to move into and sadly it's the latter that's happened uh, and rather than those firms uh, shutting up shop and, and going bust they now look at the social housing uh, sector as a as a soft target as we saw in that um, uh, inside housing article they see you as a soft target to now uh, pursue claims uh, against social landlords and local authorities now the the amount of money uh, for say, for personal injury cases anything under about 25 grand so for serious accidents for medical negligence they will still be pursued so the the, the so-called ambulance chase is still active in those markets but for pretty much any cases now below a twenty-five thousand pound threshold it is just not profitable for them to to run the case well they basically they'll just run it off banks of paralegals and they'll make a few hundred pounds per case so it run a bit like a sausage factory for disrepair cases if they can get the value of the repairs left outstanding over a thousand pounds then the claim will go into what's known as the fast track now, the fast track is just simply for these purposes it means that they recover their costs if the value of the of the repairs outstanding is less than one thousand pounds then the claim would go into the small claims track if there are no repairs at all which means that they cannot bring a claim as what's known as specific performance. So anyone that's seen these claims, they will say, and we claim damages. And then they will say an order that the claimant, that's like an order that the defendant carries out the repairs as per the hired guns schedule. So that those words, an order that the defendant carries out the repairs is what is known as an order in specific performance. It, it's an essentially, it's an injunction claim, a mandatory injunction to force you as the landlord to do works. If they can't insert those lines because there's no works to be done, the financial limit then changes. It's no longer a thousand pounds, which is quite a low threshold. It now becomes based on the value of the damages. And to get into the fast track, they now need to have a damages claim above ten thousand pounds which in general is quite is quite rare. It's quite a high claim for disrepair. Most more often than not, they're below that. So the trick there, as you can see, is get the works done as quick as you can. You've got these two competing demands. Now, the, the tenants lawyers will be trying to fob you off as much as possible. They'll be telling their clients not to let you in to deny access. And the reason why they do operate those tactics is so that when they issue the claim, there are repair works to be out, left to be done. So they want works outstanding at the point they issue their claim, because then they can get into the fast track and you have to pay their costs. So, yep, so the trick is you get in as quick as you can, get the works carried out. That means the case will, if it's below ten thousand pounds, will go into the small claims track, and the and that means that you don't have to pay their, their legal costs. So really important get the works done as fast as you possibly can uh, i think that pretty much then concludes it for me so we'll have a a general q a my, my colleagues will join me on the virtual stage we'll all huddle together to uh, to answer any questions And there we are. We uh, we are all on the on the virtual stage. Then thank you very much, Clive, for those concluding remarks.
and we now have a good period of time for what I'm sure will be an interesting and useful general chat. There has been a lot of commentary on the chat function, and I know, Clive, that you have answered a good number of them, but there are um, some more recent uh, comments and questions. Uh, what I will do is ask uh, colleagues on the call to also raise their hand if they would like to say a few words as well, and I will look up for that. But in the meantime, uh, I wonder whether the panel might want to respond to uh, Joseph's question. How can quantum be assessed in the event that repairs, the repairs history has been lost or is not available? Very good question. Who wants to tackle that one first? I'll take that first, if you like, Jonathan. Uh, yes, please. Oh dear. Uh, well, let's let's go back to the beginning. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the tenant has to prove that you've been put on notice, and uh, so you don't have to prove a negative. The tenant has to prove that. But the second thing is, of course, that uh, the tenant doesn't have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. The tenant just has to prove on the balance of probabilities that you were told of uh, disrepair. Now, when you're being cross-examined, you want to persuade a judge that you keep a good repairs history and you keep track of your cases. You know when a repair is coming in, you know when it's been dealt with, etc. If you've lost your repairs history, you can't show that. And uh, I mean, I think that uh, plenty of judges would uh, then not have much confidence in you. And when a tenant comes back and fires back and says, well, this is what has happened. I have told them by telephone, by email, that they don't keep good records. Oh, no, you're quite right. We don't, says the landlord. Well, you're in an awful lot of trouble there, I think. I mean, it doesn't. Uh, open up the uh, floodgates. I don't think you can make the most outlandish claims that simply a matter of common sense won't stack up. But I think repairs history, uh, repairs records, uh, and I mean, I think this has been uh, mentioned four or five times in, in the course of this presentation, are really, really, really important. So that would be my answer to that question. I'm sure others might want to put something in as well. Thank you, Ian. Um, any other, any colleague would like to add to that? No, just, just as, as Ian said, if you then have a uh, balance of probability, what is more likely than not? And you have Mrs. Miggins uh, in the witness box sobbing and saying that I reported it to my landlord and I remember it as if it was yesterday because it was my daughter's birthday and I had to cancel her party and oh, I can remember it like it was yesterday, Your Honour. Uh, and then the housing officer goes into into the witness box and is asked, well, what do you say about this? Do you have any records? And you, your response is, no, we've lost them all. Then the judge is going to believe what Mrs. Miggins says as more likely than not. So so the notice of disrepair will simply go to whatever date the tenant alleges that she told you. So not having any repair records puts you at a very, very significant disadvantage. Thank you, Clive. Martin has uh, posted two uh, recent questions. The first relates to just to the extent that the social housing sector is being targeted uh, by uh, law firms, as we've discussed today, and what can be done to uh, lobby for any change in approach. Has it indeed happened already? Uh, any thoughts on that? And he's also asked uh, in relation to the schedule of loss, if a failure to respond to each and every allegation uh, or items that are referred to in the loss, uh, would that amount to an admission that um, the landlord is on the hook as a consequence or not? So two questions, um, who would like to kick things off? Well, in terms of the uh, uh, lobbying, no, Martin, I'm, I'm not aware that there has been. Um, uh, that's not to say that uh, organisations cannot come together uh, and use uh, bodies such as, for example, the CIH uh, or for sort of CEOs of organisations to contact the local MPs. I certainly think this is something that the sector needs to get much better at. Uh, we, we've sort of seen how well the insurance sector did it 
uh, were able to affect the change in legislation, in effect by saying to the government that the, the, the premiums of your voters will go up if you don't do something to protect us from these administrators. And the government responded. Um, now, you know, the, the government is looking on the housing sector to, to, to be at the forefront of increasing, uh, you know, driving the economy with house building. Uh, and we're being restricted by doing so as a result of money being sucked out the market. So I absolutely think that there is room for uh, organisations to come together uh, and lobby the government in exactly the same way that the insurance sector did. But I'm not aware of anyone doing it at the moment. Thank you, Clive. And uh, Martin, second, more technical question about the uh, failure to respond to um, items in the schedule. Does that amount to an admission? Uh, it, it, in my view, no. It depends on sort of um, uh, you know when when the schedule loss is received. Uh, yeah. You ought to be uh, putting in a counter schedule, uh, so you ought to be putting in your own evidence uh, of what you think the, uh, the the one item. It may be that you agree it if it's a very low item. It may be that you don't agree it. You know, it, it may be that you agree their valuation anyway. If you don't, and it's the example that Jonathan gave. Uh, you know, a second-hand mattress or IT equipment you often see. And, of course, uh, IT equipment drops in value massively with time. So if they're claiming several hundreds of pounds for a, a 10-year-old computer, reality is that will be worth probably scrap value. So uh, absolutely, you, need, you, you do need to be putting in a counter schedule, putting in your own evidence uh, of what you say the items are worth. Just because you um, haven't done so, it doesn't stop you from doing so now assuming the case hasn't already gone to trial. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. And picking up a theme on access, we, we heard Ellie talk about access in the current coronavirus world. Uh, Ian mentioned the importance of access as well in understanding the extent of repair works that we might be responsible for. Uh, but Chris uh, has asked, when a claimant uh, solicitor states in their letter that no repairs can be carried out without their consent how would we or how should we respond um if you don't mind jonathan i'll i'll try and answer this one um i first and foremost i would uh, draw their attention to the contract either a tenancy agreement or lease which invariably uh, would contain a provision that access um, needs to be provided uh, for the landlord to inspect the property or carry out um, any any uh, remedial works now if the tenant solicitors say that uh, actually we want our expert um, to be present when an inspection is needed then um, ideally you would you would want to take uh, reasonable steps to try and accommodate that um, the downside is that again that could be used as a tactic tactic by tenants um, solicitors to sort of try and drag um, uh, the period so you would propose um, a, a number of dates and on uh, on each of those dates their expert isn't available um, in that situation you could then go a step further and consider injunction proceedings because ultimately uh, the property is your asset you are only temporarily renting it out or or leasing it um, the the lease or tenancy agreement is a contract um, and if the and in the tenant basically agrees as part of that contract to provide you access to your to the property to inspect or carry out repairs and if they fail to do so um, then ultimately you are entitled to take action um, against that breach uh, from the tenants um, ultimately you could try and argue that if that's the legal advice that they receive from their ten from their solicitors, which goes against the terms of the lease. You could try and uh, maybe seek um, damages from his solicitors. Mm. Um, unless anyone else has anything yeah, to I, add I, to that, I, I, I agree. I and mean, it's it's very often what you will see. Um, it, it's not unusual at all for uh, the the uh, claimants' lawyers uh, to be saying you can't carry out works without our consent. Uh, I mean, that's just a load of old hogwash. There, there's nothing in the pre-action protocol uh, that says that you can only do works if they agree it. I mean, it's just utter nonsense. You, you've got a, a tenancy agreement, as Ellie said, that says that you are allowed to gain access for carrying out works. 
You've also got statutory provisions uh, under both the Landlord and Tenant Act and Housing Act 1988, enabling you to get in and do works. And there was case law, which uh, either, is it either Ian or Jonathan mentioned, the, the, the case of Brakes versus Remakien in 2018, where the, the court criticised the landlord for not at least doing the works that they said were necessary. So if you have a, a difference in opinion, their hired gun wants you to do items you know, one to five, but your surveyor thinks you should be doing one to three, then get in and do the items one to three, just because they won't agree with you that this extra four and five that you say are not necessary is no reason at all for them to not get access. And if you're not getting access, go and apply for an access injunction, and then you'll have costs for the access injunction, which can be offset against any award for damages and costs from the other side. And they will adopt this policy. The reason they do it, as I just mentioned at the end, about uh, ensuring that there's more than a £1,000 worth of repair works, the reason they do it is to keep you in the fast track. It is all a game, and it is utter nonsense. You're entitled to go and do the works. And just to follow on Clive's comments, uh, I think in our experience it would be fair to say that when you threaten, formally threaten, access injunction proceedings and explain why you're entitled to pursue that course of action, nine times out of ten they will back down and they will cooperate. Uh, but you have to have the confidence, if you like, to be as robust as you need to be in order to be able to get access for that particular reason. So what we have uh, is a question from Deborah, who has asked, how can we get rid of them when your inspection basically takes you off the hook? Um, there's no, there's, there's nothing to see there, but they just won't go away. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> who would like to uh, respond? Well, 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 well Deborah, what, what often happens, and I think what you're getting at is what happens when they just go quiet. Uh, we, see it, we, we see it time and time. When they know they're not going to get paid, they, they just close their file down and they disappear. And I think that's what you're saying. Well, if you've got the works done, uh, you've agreed it with the tenants, everything's all been finished, uh, but the solicitors just simply disappear and won't respond. I think you're then pretty much safe in closing your file because you've done all the repair works. So it means that any claim will now be, uh, there won't be any specific performance, which means unless any damages claim is worth over £10,000, it will be a small claims which means that the most they can get under the small claims track is 380 quid. So it just simply is not worth their while acting. I think you're safe in closing your phone. Yeah, if, if I could say as well, I mean, I, I've got a couple of cases uh, sitting in my cabinet where we have done all of the repairs, all finished, all agreed, tenant is happy with the works that have been done. But we think that the tenant has a very, very valid claim for damages against us. And yet, uh, not a word from the uh, solicitors. And I mean, I, I'm not going to poke a sleeping bear. I'm going to leave them alone because when they come back to me, uh, they will have something. As Clive says, they may well be in the small claims court, which is why they're not interested. But certainly you will, you will get cases which will surprise you and you'll think, well, I'm astonished that the tenant solicitors aren't looking for damages here. Leave them well alone. Let them go to sleep. Be my advice there. Thank you, Lynn. That's good advice. Uh, Sa Sandra has asked, how can damages be assessed for no cold water in a bathroom? Who uh, who wants to have a go at answering uh, Sandra's question? That's a, that's a new one, isn't it? Go, no, no cold okay. water. Um, I mean, we saw... I mean, a complete loss of heating and hot water was about 75%, wasn't it? Um, and no heating, I think, was about 43 So, so, But cu no cold water, I think. If you've got a bathroom, um, what are you going to be using cold water for? Probably just running your toothbrush under, aren't you? So uh, not a massive loss. I mean, if you've, you've got cold water, presumably, in the kitchen, um, these are all the things we're going to be looking at. I mean, if, if there's another bathroom that can be used, um, I mean, I think this can be nominal um uh, uh, to be honest um i think my colleagues may agree they may not but i don't think you, you're going to get uh, a high amount of damages for that one <laughs> no. well I, I assume that there's cold water in the bath otherwise it would make showering impossible unless you've got a very high pain threshold or <laughs> best off skin um, uh, so i assume that i assume that they don't have to run a bath and then leave it for an hour to go cold before they can get in it 
Uh, I mean, if, if, if you've got no cold water going in, so you can't shower uh, and you can't bath, then, then that would possibly be something quite high because it would virtually take away your uh, the ability to, uh, to, to, to wash so un un unless you leave it for an hour to go cold. But if it's simply that there's no water, cold water in the, in the sink, it, it clearly it needs to be repaired. But in terms of loss of enjoyment for not having cold water in a sink tap, I agree with Will. That's going to be very, very nominal because there would be easy workarounds. Yeah. So, Sandra, in terms of a diminution of rent percentage, uh, given Will's comments and Clive's comments, I would suggest you're looking at between two and maybe six percent diminution of rent value. So on the very low side, perhaps even um, somewhere in the middle of those two percentages. Uh, and so minimal, it, it would be the short, the short point or the short answer. So Carl has asked, well, has mentioned many RSLs have multiple tenancy formats in circulation with slightly different repair covenants. An association may attempt to deal with areas of uh, grey by publishing repair responsibilities. Um, is there any case law guidance on what the responsibilities are uh, as a customer responsibility? Um, there we go. I hope I've done that question uh, justice, Carl, but um, any thoughts from the panel? association may hold a line that the customer needs to empty the well, th 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 this is this is the warren and keen isn't it mm. Mm. yes yeah i mean where are we with this? i mean i think if you've I published think... if you've published um what you expect tenants to repair um i mean presumably there may be reference to the policy in your tenancy agreement um there may not um but i think if you if you've stated and, and you've circulated um repairing policies what seeing what will fix um you can refer to those for sure um but yeah in terms of case law warren and keen um ten like manner odd jobs around the house um modern day versions of sweeping chimneys and and that kind of thing um i think i'm sorry ian i interrupted you and if you want to Continue. No, 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 carry, carry on. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, looking at these things, you, I mean, if I'm the, if I'm the uh, tenant's lawyer, I want to read the tenancy agreement uh, and I often won't have it because the uh, I, when I write my letter of claim, I'm asking for the tenancy agreement. I'm going to look at what it says. I'm going to look at things like whether it says we'll keep it in repair or shock horror will keep it in good condition because that's a higher threshold and uh, i'm also going to look at your tenant's handbook and see what the tenant's handbook says and i'm wondering also in some cases whether it will say that the tenant's handbook is actually a term of the tenancy agreement too so all of these things you have to look for and you can find bear traps there or maybe not as the case may be but i mean i would generally agree with what will said there but I think sort of where Carl goes on to talk about um, having then a, uh, a tenant's handbook and he says about um, an association may require a customer to empty a water tray from a heat recovery unit. Uh, that, that is a, an entirely reasonable thing to expect uh, a tenant to do. Uh, and the Warren and Key in the 1957, as Will just mentioned back then, Lord Denning suggested that the tenant should be sweeping the chimney and emptying the tank in the winter. Well, we don't have tanks and you don't need we don't have chimneys and we don't need to empty water tanks in the in the winter but it's the sort of thing that any reasonable homeowner would do now you wouldn't necessarily be expecting a tenant to get their ladders out and start repairing roofing tiles or do pointing but emptying a tray of water from a heat exchanger absolutely that, that would be part of their, their their duties to do the little jobs around the house that any reasonable homeowner would do thank you clive Right, Teresa has asked a couple of questions. The first uh, one relating to the issuing of court proceedings. Uh, if they issue court proceedings to get an order for specific performance, would your advice be to try to settle at that stage uh, and to get in and do the repair work as soon as possible? Yeah, Is I mean, the- A legal and tactical question. Well, <laughs> yes, I mean, the, the the general concern here, I think, is I suppose it's a cost benefit analysis. Uh, the longer it goes on for, uh, the more costly it's going to be, and uh, the uh, 
tenant solicitors are incredibly expensive. They, if, if you can think of a reasonable figure for cost, perhaps the reasonable figure for cost may be six or seven thousand pound. They will double and sometimes treble it, and they will have a darn good go at arguing that they're entitled to all of those costs. Uh, I think that as for specific performance, uh, it depends really. I mean, if, if the specific performance is also going to cost you thousands and thousands of pounds to do, and you simply don't believe it's justified, then it may be difficult. I mean, it, it may be that you're saying to somebody before they issue proceedings, our position is it's not necessary. We believe X, Y, and Z is necessary, and we've done that. As for any further works, we uh, consider we can monitor the situation, and if uh, disrepair problems manifest themselves, then perhaps we can go back in and do it, because it's always uh, a remedy that the court can turn down specific performance. Okay. And so uh, you've always got to remember that. And if you as a landlord are saying, well, I agree with nine out of 10 of the things that you say in your expert report, but the 10th thing, which will cost me thousands and thousands of pounds to do, it's not entirely clear to me that that's necessary. I've done 90% of what you asked me to do, and I'm saying to you that I will do the remainder of that work if it transpires that it's necessary. But often by monitoring over a very, very short space of time, you can find whether, for example, you've cured a damp problem. Uh, and if it gets to trial and it turns out that the works you did in the first place covered off that uh, problem, then specific performance goes out of the window. And perhaps the uh, defence have to start thinking about whether they're paying your costs. Uh, so that, that would be what I, I, I would say about that. But generally speaking, I think if you consider that there's a very good chance that these works need to be done, do them. Uh, don't hang about, get them done as soon as you possibly can and ideally uh, get in before they issue court proceedings. It may be that you're not entirely sure it's necessary for this element of specific performance to be done. But getting back to a cost benefit analysis, if you think that the specific performance isn't going to cost very much, then surely it's worth just saying, well, I don't agree that you're right, but I will look into this and try and do it now in order to prove that I'm right or prove that you're right. Uh, so I'd, I'd be very, very careful with all of these cases and, and saying there's one fixed plan that will work in all cases. You've got to be prepared to be flexible, look into the facts and circumstances of every case you get. Mm. Uh, absolutely. The only thing I would add uh, to what Ian has said, Theresa, is before I would get my checkbook out, I would look to see if I had notice of it in the first place. Mm. Because if I wasn't on notice and no reasonable period of time has elapsed, that I'm not in breach of my repairing covenants and the tenant is entitled to damages. You will see claims for specific performance always being issued because they have to, otherwise they won't get you into the fast track. Um, so your, your question is try and settle. Depends whether you've been on notice. Shall we get in and get the repairs done? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly what you want to avoid is an order of the court requiring you to carry out a schedule of works, because once the order of the court is made, invariably a cost order will accompany that order and you then on the back foot. It's the other party that then controls the next steps, the narratives and indeed even the optics of the exercise. So you should vigorously oppose any request for specific performance, rather tie them up so that they have uh, no choice but to agree a schedule that you uh, will want to uh, agree and then undertake those works but without the threat or indeed the making of a court order uh, on on this sort of on the background as a way in the background as it were okay so that's uh, that's that we are uh, we now are um seven minutes before the one o'clock uh, finish so what i would do is take a couple of additional questions uh, I've got one that uh, refers to the protocol. Uh, Martin has asked uh, about the protocol, protocol 6.3, a reason for us not to do repairs. Now, uh, Ellie, would you like to just remind us of some of the very, very key uh, do's and don'ts in relation to how one responds to a letter of claim that is served uh, that uh, is supposedly protocol compliant, but is actually sent to the wrong individual at the housing association or public landlord in question. What are the key do's and don'ts, if you like, of uh, of receiving a letter like that? 
Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So obviously, first and foremost, make sure that it is um, addressed to the correct landlord. Uh, what we tend to see is that, for example, where we have a, um, a group structure for a landlord, they tend to um, sort of put the most common name uh, that basically they can find from a Google search for the landlord when in fact the tenancy is granted from, um, I don't know, company C in, in the group. Um, so again, until the, um, uh, until the correct landlord has been served with a letter of claim, you don't have to engage in the protocol. And in that situation, you would just go back and say, um, we are not responsible for this property, please directed to the, to the correct landlord. Um, also, as, uh, as I've mentioned, the letter of claim, the protocol um, mentions, um, well, states what you must include. Uh, what we tend to see is, for example, the protocol says that the letter of claim must detail the previous instances where um, notice was served on the landlord. What we then tend to see, as, I, as I've mentioned in my presentation, is um, something along the lines of the tenant has has given notice on um, occasions so numerous um, as to particularize. That is not sufficient. Um, you, you can try and um, uh, respond to that by um, uh, the basically disclosing the repairs tenancy, your communication um, logs, and just show actually um, since the tenancy started, we've only been um, contacted by the tenant on such and such dates, for example. Or, um, I don't know, you, the tenant could have only um, um, uh, made contact to discuss rent arrears, for example, but never, ever mention uh, repairs. And again, it all goes, uh, it go, it all goes back to the fact of uh, um, you, the tenant has to prove uh, on, uh, on the balance of probabilities that they gave you notice. If the tenant um, if the tenant in their letter all they say is, oh, I've given you notice so many times, I forgot, but then you're able to bring back your repairs history, which says, well, actually, this is all the contact we've had since the beginning of the um, tenancy agreement. Ne never um, have we been put on notice. Um, and the, the tenant has started legal action without actually giving um, the landlord a, a, a fair chance to um, know about the disrepair and take um, remedial action, then again, on balance of probabilities, uh, the, the judge is likely to sort of side with you. Um, 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 again, the um, um, the expert point on the um, letter of claim, we tend to see, um, as uh, as Clive show, uh, mentioned in his presentation, that leaflet about the local solicitors well as a similar argument runs with experts uh, the protocol um, states that the experts should be local or in the vicinity of the property whereas we have uh, these hired guns experts coming down from um, um, I don't know over 50 100 miles distance from the property um, uh, you, you um, I, I think the I think the um, Line, uh, line of reasoning is don't ignore it, address it. If you don't agree with something or if you feel that the um, letter of claim doesn't follow the letter of the protocol, you should raise that as an issue because it will all come, if, if proceedings um, then commence, it would all come down. Non-compliance with the protocol means the, the other side can recover all of their costs. They, mu they could be penalized on costs. So uh, rather than sort of staying silent, just try and dispute as much as you can, but don't sort of try to get bogged down of our, on arguments of you haven't complied with the protocol so I'm not going to engage with you. Um, um, so that, that would be a few practical pointers from me if Thank anyone you, else wants to add. I think mm -hmm. just to, to, to add on the um, this uh, point respect to 6.3d I think it's at the Broad School I mean that's just you listing the repairs you're intending to carry out and if you're listing repairs um, that you intended to carry out, maybe you've already carried them out. You just say we've carried these out, um, and if they're that's why they're saying you shouldn't be carrying them out, you should then be directing them to the aims of the protocol, which I've got up here. Uh, aim two one B promote the speedy and appropriate carrying out of any remedial works. So you can be saying, well, you've in, it, you, your clients invoke the protocol to uh, to get their their alleged disrepair resolved. We're going to carry out these works, and then uh, another element of the protocol says that they must provide access. There you go. Um, so you can be saying, well, you've, you've invoked the protocol. We've identified X, Y, Z. 
I suspect if they've not had an expert going yet, they won't want you to be doing any work because then their expert's not going to have anything to to um, take note of. Um, and if you've documented the issues yourselves as much as possible, their, their expert can refer to those. And if you really do want to carry out works as soon as possible, i.e. emergency works, just say to them, we're carrying them out on this date. If you want an expert to go in, make sure they go in before then. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you. Right, um, I'm going to take one last question, uh, and that's from Tina, who has made a further comment in respect of the compensation threshold. And she says, where uh, damages of below £1,000 is paid, what is the position in relation to costs? Should we also be paying their legal costs uh, for the trouble they took to get us to agree uh, a small amount of damages? Uh, who wants to tackle that one and um, offer their no, thoughts? I, 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 would, I would say no, Tina, if the damages, assuming there's no specific performance, uh, damages, or actually even if, even if it was, if, if compensation is below £1,000, value of works was very minimal or not at all, uh, so below £1,000 as well, the only cost they're entitled to would be the cost they would get under the small claims court. Uh, I, I've got a, a case that I've been arguing where the other side have pitched in for seven, eight grand's worth of costs, and we've offered them three hundred and eighty pounds because that's what they would get under the small claims court. Absolutely, and you know, as Ian mentioned in his presentation, legal costs are often the sting in the disrepair tale, and they are because whilst you might settle your damages element of the claim for uh, a relatively small amount of money. Uh, £1,500, £2,000 to throw out a number, their legal costs that they ask you to pay as a consequence of that agreement could be three, four, five, perhaps even ten times that number. What you do need to do is not roll over in respect of agreeing to pay that sort of level of legal costs. You absolutely must fight back. And the way to do that is to challenge uh, uh, each and every item of the, the bill that they then send you on the back of an agreement being reached, what we call serving points of dispute on them. That will invite a negotiation between you and the other party uh, where a more suitable level of uh, legal fees payable is then agreed. But do not roll over and pay their legal costs at first at, at first question. Uh, so where we there we have it. It's just gone at one o'clock. Uh, we have covered a lot of ground this morning. We've looked at the definition of disrepair as a legal construct. We've considered the new fitness legislation and also the coronavirus rules on access. We spent some time looking at defences to these types of claims that uh, you are having to meet. We've looked at damages and case law, and we've gone in a sense full circle by looking at why we've been targeted and what sort of tips and traps we could offer uh, to help you fight your corner. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the general chat commentary was most useful. Um, we will try to capture much of what was said uh, in the notes that we will disseminate after uh, this masterclass, along with the slides and a recording of today's events. I do hope you found today interesting and useful, and I take this opportunity to thank you for joining us and also to invite you uh, to another masterclass that we're hosting next month on uh, leasehold management and related expertise. So thank you for attending the first of a series of masterclasses. I hope we covered the disrepair ground well and you found today interesting and useful. Thank you for joining us and I'm sure we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.